This is Duke University. Good evening and welcome to the 2018 Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture and Boyarsky Lecture in Law, Medicine, and Ethics called Poverty, Health, and Social Justice with the Reverend William J. Barber II. Reverend Barber, it takes a village to bring in Reverend Barber, so I'm going to, I'd like to acknowledge some of the folks who've, who've been involved. I'm Dr. Jeff Baker, Director of the Trent Center for Bioethics, Humanities, and History of Medicine within the Duke School of Medicine. Our center brings together faculty and associates interested in the insights provided by the medical humanities on all aspects of healthcare, especially the actual practice of medicine and research. Our mission includes teaching and exploring the questions of bioethics and social justice within the broader matrix of medicine's history and social context. Our event tonight is presented jointly by the Trent Center and the Sanford School of Public Policy. The Sanford School has more than 80 faculty members multiple research centers, several master's programs here and abroad, a PhD program in one of Duke's largest undergraduate majors. Our event is also co-sponsored by the Center for Child and Family Policy, POLIS, the Center for Political Leadership, Innovation and Service, and Sanford's Bridge and Communities. The Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture is made possible by a gift to the university from the William K. K. Keenan Charitable Trust in honor of the late Terry Sanford. Terry Sanford would have turned 100 years old in August and is a much beloved and respected figure in North Carolina. He dedicated his life to ethical leadership and public life. During his tenure as governor of North Carolina from 1961 to 1965, he focused on strengthening education, combating poverty, and expanding civil rights. He supported desegregation when other governors were blocking African American students from entering university gates. In keeping with the example set by Terry Sanford, the purpose of this distinguished lecture is to bring on campus men and women of the highest personal and professional stature to speak to the Duke community. And tonight's event is also the 2018 Boyarsky lecture, Lectureship in Law, Medicine, and Ethics, created through a, trust, through a gift from Drs. Saul and Rose Boyarsky to bring, to, to bring distinguished lecturers to Duke University who can inspire achievement in social justice and public health through science. We are delighted to welcome them here this evening on, the, on, on this, the, the UN's World Day of Social Justice, along with their children and grandchildren who have come from far and wide to join us tonight. And thanks to all of you, students, faculty, and members of the community alike, for coming to this very special event. Please silence your cell phones and note that we are streaming this event live to the Stanford School of Public Policy Facebook page. I'm going to return to the microphone at the end of Reverend Barber's talk to moderate an audience Q&A, but for now I would like to welcome Kelly Brunell, the Dean of the Stanford School of Pu Public Policy and Director of the Duke World Food Policy Center to introduce our distinguished guest. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the staff of the Trent Center for working together with our most capable team at the Sanford School of Public Policy to present this special event. The Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II is the president and senior lecturer of the nonprofit organization known as Repairs of the Breach. He is a minister, an author, and a professor. Above all, he is an inspirational leader. Reverend Dr. Barber served as president of the North Carolina NAACP, the largest chapter in the South from 2006 to 2017. In this role, he started and led the Forward Together moral movement in which many people in this room participated. The movement gained national notoriety with its Moral Monday protest at the North Carolina General Assembly. These protests drew tens of thousands of residents, and over the course of the campaign, police arrested more than 1,200 protesters. In 2014, Reverend Barber led the largest moral march in the state's history with an estimated 80,000 people calling on North Carolina's elected officials to embrace a moral public policy agenda. Inspired by events in North Carolina, grassroots moral movements 
grew in a number of other states, such as Georgia, Florida, and Missouri. Reverend Barber has been a powerful and tireless advocate for voters' rights, fair legislative districts, health care reform, labor and workers' rights, immigrants' rights, reparation for women survivors of eugenics, release of the Wilmington 10, and educational equality. In 2009, Governor Beverly Perdue presented Reverend Barber with the Order of the Longleaf Pine, North Carolina's highest citizenship award. Some of his contributions to the state include helping win same-day registration early voting in North Carolina, the only state in the South, helping secure passage of the Racial Justice Act of 2009 to protect wrongly convicted African-American men from death row. The North Carolina General Assembly subsequently repealed that act. Reverend Barber is pastor of Greenleaf Christian Church, Disciples of Christ in Goldsboro, North Carolina. He is a graduate of North Carolina Central University, the Duke Divinity School, and Drew University Theological School where he earned a doctorate in ministry. Since stepping down from his leadership of the NC NAACP, Reverend Barber became president of the Repairs of the Breach and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We are honor honored and humbled by the sheer power of tonight's guest to lead North Carolinians and now the country toward social justice. And I can say there's no warmer man that I believe I've ever met. Please help me welcome the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. now for the poor of this society. They are living in tragic conditions because of the terrible economic injustices that keep them locked in. We have to deal with our war economy and systemic racism and systemic poverty and ecological devastation. And finally, we have to deal with the moral narrative. This wall, this is sin of the highest order. We are traveling around this country building this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. What we want to do now is hear a little bit from the local community who are a part of this campaign. I spent five years, five or so more years homeless. Living on minimum wage has caused me to have to figure out on a daily basis how to afford basic necessities. While the U.S. sends trillions abroad, my friends, family, and fellow veterans suffer the economic consequences of the war economy. I have two children, and I enjoy raising them while acknowledging that being poor is a struggle of human rights. But when I lost my housing, health care and income all at the same time. I was terrified, panicked. I want to stand here and reclaim the power and dignity of the mujeres in my life. I can't afford to pay a cab. It was one thing to know that you didn't have water and you couldn't afford your water. It's a whole nother to find out that they shut off your entire community and none of you matter. And in the aftermath of climate change disasters, Poor people are, and people of color are the ones to lose their homes. Who can't survive this 725? No parents should have, in America should have to bury their pet, their children for lack of medical expense. Being poor is not a sin. Poverty is a sin. Being homeless is not a sin. Homelessness is a sin. And we are here and it's time for us to be the remnant that can transform the nation. We are calling for a season of moral resistance. 
a season of organizing, a season of nonviolent, massive civil disobedience. There will be a movement that will break through the con and cut through the lies and bring people together to save the heart and the soul of this democracy and this world. Hello, home. Hello, North Carolina. Forward together. All right, it's good to be here tonight. I'm so thankful to God and to, to, for his grace. I've been under the weather uh, with a bacterial infection and had to come off the road a bit, but I'm so thankful uh, to be here tonight with all of you. Um, I see so many folk, if I start naming people, that's going to be the next three hours. So I'm going to do like we do down south. What up, y'all? <laughs> if the light folk could help me on these lights a little bit, I'm getting a shadow. Uh, but um, I'll do the best I can tonight. I'm so thankful to this great family that has sponsored um, this event, to the Trent Center, to the great legacy of Terry Sanford. Uh, to the Pub School of Public Policy. Um, it is such a humbling reality uh, to be invited to be here and to see all of you out on tonight. I want for a little while tonight to talk about SOS, saving our ship of state the saving of our ship of state. And I want to suggest that in order to do that, there are some things we must first S see clearly. There's some organizing we must do intentionally. And then we must stand together. We must see clearly, we must organize intentionally, and we must stand together. Since the rejection election of 2016, when in many ways white rage propelled the candidate who was even endorsed by the KKK to the Republican National Convention and on to the White House, race has ever before been ever before us in America. But our national conversation about racism has many times become confused in the post Charlottesville debate in a struggle of whether or not we define racism through the lens of personal biases or the lens of public policy. Now, make it be clear, every politician in America condemned hate after Charlottesville, or at least those who had any kind of political savvy. <laughs> but racism is not about hate alone. Did you hear Richard Spencer, who spent some time here at Duke, the white supremacist, when he went back to Charlottesville a few weeks ago, he said, we came peacefully and we will come peacefully again. He said that when he endorsed the current occupier of the White House, it was after he heard his positions on immigrants. Racism isn't about whether you have a black friend or even use the N-word. Institutional racism is about what's written into policy. It's about power. I would even go further to say it's not so much about the statues as it is the statutes. 
For instance, my good friend Dr. Tim Tyson and I have conversations often and how in a rush, many of the people in the media and others got it wrong about the statues. They ran out and said, these statues were put up to honor the Civil War. No, they weren't. Most, 90% of them weren't. Robert E. Lee said he wouldn't even be buried in a, conser a Confederate uh, uniform. In fact, if you had put, tried to put those statues up immediately after the Civil War, you would have been locked up for treason. 90% of those statues were put up after Plessy versus Ferguson, 1898. Between 1898, uh, Representative Black, and 1924. And in fact, the one in Charlottesville was commissioned in 1919. Uh, more to pay homage, not to the Civil War, but to Woodrow Wilson's election who was a white supremacist, who when he became, got into office, he immediately stopped the desegregation of the federal government, and he had his entire staff, a hundred years before Bannon was ever in the White House, to watch Birth of a Nation, that was written by a playwright from Shelby, North Carolina, who used to be a member of the North Carolina Senate. And the book was called The Klansman and it was turned into Birth of a Nation. So that statue was put up, was commissioned in 1919 to, for, to, 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 as white nationalists were saying, we have control of the laws again, the policy again. Could it be that that's why they chose that statue to march around? Because in the mindset of a white nationalist, it's not about just hate. It's about policy. What is racism? Racism is what happened after the Civil War. When uh, by 1868, black and white people came together and they formed fusion coalitions all over the South and they rewrote constitutions like the one here in North Carolina. They put this in the preamble, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all persons are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among which are life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruit of their own labor and the pursuit of happiness. Or our constitution, uh, article 11, section four, that says beneficent provision to the poor, the unfortunate, and the orphan is the first duty of a civilized and a Christian nation. That's the that's 1868 constitutional language being written by black and white people coming together. They rewrote the voting laws and made sure that all, at least men, could vote. They, they rewrote laws about wages. They provided health care. By 1877, you had 40, 40 hospitals, Freedman hospitals, that were providing health care for blacks, former slaves, former free blacks, and poor whites. Free. Uh, 1872, you had the 13th Amendment, ending slavery, the 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law, the 15th Amendment, providing protection for voting. Public education in these fusion coalitions of black and white people coming together by 1868 was a public constitutional right. A constitutional right. Something we still do not have in our federal constitution to this day. What, was ra what is racism? Racism is when in 1872 the Klan is founded to scare white people and make them stop working with black people. Racism is Governor Holden, the governor who led us into Reconstruction, being impeached because he dared to take on the Klan and dared to push forward progressive racism. Racism is a, is a group calling themselves the Redemption Movement. But what they meant by redeeming is redeeming America from the sin of black and white people working together. Racism is in 1877, a guy running for president and losing the popular vote but getting elected anyhow. In 1877, by the Electoral College and making a promise that if the electoral college are won, you know, most of us can't get into that college, but those who are in that college, if they would give him the presidency, he would give them the federal courts. He would pull the troops out of the South. 
He, they, he, they said yes, he said yes. He became president even though he lost the popular vote. He turned the judiciary, the attorney general's office over to the racist extremists. And by 1883 to 1875, Civil Rights Act was overturned with only one dissenter, Justice Harlan out of Kentucky. By 1896, you had Plessy versus Ferguson. By 1898, you had the Wilmington riots that were designed to take back the government and put it in the proper hands of the white man. And by 1901, the last elected black congressperson was put out of office, George White from North Carolina. And it would be 90 years before North Carolina had another African-American congress. That's racism. It's about policy. Racism is, what is racism? Racism is like what happened after the Civil Rights Movement. <clears throat> when extremists uh, who happened to be white were afraid of losing power, they learned how to perpetrate a culture of racism without appearing to be racist. So they used code words and whistle words. The Southern strategy is the former name for it. It was a strategy deliberately designed to play the race card in a way that didn't sound racist, but it make, would make Southern whites vote against black and brown people who should have been their natural allies. You know, GOP strategist Lee Atwater told us what it was like. He didn't, he was on tape, but he kept talking, and so the tape is out there. He said, you, this is what he said, you start out in 1954, and you want to get elected, you say things like nigger, 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 but by 1968, you can't say that because of the backfire. So instead, you talk about stuff like states' rights, forced busing, and then you get real abstract, and you say the only thing you want to do is cut taxes. And that doesn't sound racist to the untrained ear, but it's code word because it sounds like all the things you're talking about are totally economic, but the byproduct of them is that blacks get hurt worse than whites and whites are taught in particularly in the South to blame their problems, not on the oligarchy or the aristocracy, but black and brown people who are getting quote unquote free stuff and using their tax dollars. The target of the Southern strategy was initially the states of the old Confederacy with the goal of developing a solid South because the extremists knew that if black and brown and white people ever formed coalitions in the South, they could not win. They had seen it before in the 1800s. And so they said, we'll lock up the 13 states in the South. You know, if you lock up the 13 states in the South, that's 171 electoral votes before you ever have an election. You only need 270 to get elected, which means if you can lock up 13 states, you only need 99 electoral votes from the other 37 states. If you lock up 13 states, you can control 26 members of the United States Senate, which means you only need 25 from the other 37 states. You can control 31% of the United States House, that means you only need 20% from the other 37 states to hold a majority. And if you do it right, you can also win in the Rust Belt, you can win in the Wheat Belt, and you can win in some of the ethnic conclaves of the North. And they learned this by watching as Wallace, George Wallace was called the greatest loser of all time because he taught folk that if you can find a way to use code words to split people, you can get them to vote against their own self-interest. So if you notice history, the first thing we have to see is that the problem is not Trump. Don't let anybody tell you right now, make you think a problem is just Trump. Yes, he embraced and emboldened white nationalists and, this, and, this, and this, this Southern strategy that was designed to last 50 years, and this is the 50th year, by the way, 2018. But long before Trump mastered the con artist, of, the con of the Southern strategy, he had an audience that had been cultivated for 50 years and many other people that have been using this strategy. We are seeing right now what Nail Painter calls the iconography of an American call and response. The call is racial progress and the simultaneously or short thereafter, the response is, as Carol Anderson has aptly named it, regression or white rage. Trump and those that support him in policy driven racism are symptoms, are symptoms of a deeper mal moral malady. 
and we must see this. And we, not, not just black people, but all of us must see this. We misunderstand the challenge of systemic racism if we think it's just about dislike of black people. No, systemic racism is dislike of democracy. Truth be told, you can be black and embrace and encourage white nationalism. You can be black and be so fooled by the system that you end up participating in the system and become a, a, a cheerleader, if you will, for the very proponents of institutional racism. Systemic racism is simply the perpetuation of a system where the ideal of whiteness and white power are the norm in our common life, and it must be challenged by blacks and whites and Jews and Christians together. It is to accept the heresy that some people were not made in the image of likeness of God, therefore you can write them out of your public policy. Now to see this up close, let's look at a particular instance of racism and white supremacy, which is voter suppression. Before Trump, since the US Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in 2013, there has been an assault on voting rights in this country. Actually, it began long before that in 2010. Let me give you some numbers. I know everybody's talking about Russia, but here is the most unreported story. And by underreporting it and not dealing with it, America is once again making a mistake and not dealing with this issue of racism. Would rather deal with Russia, should, but, but, there were 868 fewer sites in the black and voting sites in the black and brown and poor community in 2016. 22. That's the number of states that have passed voter suppression laws since 2010. 22 states, that's 44 senators, and 50% of the United States House of Representatives come from states that have engaged in proven voter suppression. More than four years, or nearly 2,000 days, that's how long it's been since the Supreme Court gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Now I want you to put that in context. Strom Thurmond was a show enough racist. He only filibustered the 1957 Civil Rights Act for 24 hours. Ryan and McConnell and Boehner have participated in filibustering fixing the Voting Rights Act for nearly 2,000 days. Hmm. We talk about a person winning. Trump, for instance, winning by 20,000 votes in Wisconsin there were 250,000 votes suppressed in Wisconsin. We won in North Carolina. We beat back Tom Farr and the white supremacists. And yet, in 2016 in North Carolina, we had over 150 fewer sites doing old early voting. This is the election hacking that no one wants to talk about because it would force us to deal with systemic racism in America. Not whether or not someone has a black friend. That's not even the issue. Tim Scott, who's black, is against the restoration of a Voted Rights Act, so he is an enabler of white nationalism and white supremacy, and he's black. I don't know how much Trump got help from Russia, but it's manifestly clear that he could not have stolen the election without the help of systemic racism. Whether the tactics are partisan gerrymandering, a discriminatory voter ID, the rollback of early voting, same day registration, the place and the places where we see the attack. We wouldn't have the Senate today we have today, or the Congress we have today, or the General Assembly that we have today without voter suppression. And we're not talking about, we're not talking about um, um, something we have heard, we're talking about that even the Supreme, this Supreme Court, the Roberts Supreme Court, even Clarence Thomas had to vote unanimously on the case we said and agree that what happened in North Carolina that began under the leadership of Tom Tillis was, was surgical racism. Now watch this. You say, well, I thought he was going to talk about health and poverty. I'm getting there. But you... <laughs> But the problem is so many neoliberals want to talk about poverty without dealing with race, and you can't do that. You can't do that. Because here's the, here's the trick, 
and the hook that you, we must understand. If you put up a map, the same places where we see the attacks on voting rights the most are the same places that have the highest level of poverty, the highest level of the lack of living wages, the most attacks against health care, the greatest attacks on immigrants and the LGBT community, the, the states that have the lowest funding of public education and the lowest labor rights and union density are the, all the same states where politicians have engaged in voter suppression. Now, what does that mean? Politicians are you who use surgical and targeted racist voter suppression, then when they get, use it to get in power, but once they get into power, they promote and codify policies that hurt all Americans, especially poor and working class white people. So the very people that use gimmicks to fool certain people to vote for them, once they get into office, they pass policies. For instance, we have a General Assembly that used voter suppression to get into office. Once they got into office in the first 15 days or so of being in office in 2013, they denied Medicaid expansion to 500,000 people. Now, if you heard them talk about it and understood the code words, they were kind of suggesting we don't need to give health care to these, quote, lazy folk who aren't doing something, or i.e. black and brown people. Well, in actuality, 346,000 of the 500,000 people denied Medicaid expansion are white. And 30,000 are veterans. So they got elected through voter suppression and racist gerrymandering, but then used the power to hurt poor people and sick people. Many have not wanted to look at this, but we must see this if we're going to save our ship of state. There's a second thing we must see, and that is we must see the heretical work of so-called Christian nationalists and white evangelicals. You got to see it. Now, Many of Donald Trump's critics have raised concerns in recent weeks about his alleged affair with porn star Stormy Daniels. And if the revelations are true, Trump's infidelity is a matter between him, his God, and his spouse. Quickly, for in but interestingly, so-called white evangelicals rushed to defend the president, urging the nation to forgive and move on. All these things were years ago, Jerry Fal Falwell said. Uh, Tony Perkins told Politico he and others were willing to give the president a mulligan on issues of personal morality because he, Trump, champions an evangelical agenda. Now, it's easy to point out the hypocrisy of men who have cried so loudly about character in public leadership only to defend a man who spent his life flaunting conventional morality. But the truth is, can I drop this little truth in here? America has had to give every president a mulligan on some personal failing or another. If Trump's pastoral advisors want to forgive him, that's their right. Because infidelity normally has its own consequences. But, but, the great or moral issue here, and what is heretical, is that of this faith they're trying to push in the public square, is when they use religion to cover up his immoral and pornographic policies, which are hurting vulnerable people and undermining our democracy. In Ezekiel, let me be, one of the great Jewish prophets said, in Ezekiel 22, said, um, your politicians have become like wolves, devouring the poor and hurting the immigrants. But there is a worse sin. The preachers are covering up for the politician and claiming to say things that God has not said. And so in, the, in matters of public justice, no one has a right to give the president a mulligan. If you want to on personal thing, that's you. But when it comes to public policy, especially in this nation, for our nation's theological leaders, who should be the torchbearers of public morality, not the enablers of ethical decay. 
Unfortunately, what we are seeing now is the revival of a specific and subversive strand of Christianity, one with a historic legacy stretching all the way back to slavery, which is heresy. The infidelity, oh, they shouldn't have taught me the Bible at Duke Theological Seminary. <laughs> the infidelity that we must concern ourselves with is what the Bible calls going a whoring after other gods. A whoring after other gods is whenever a nation chooses to hurt the poor and oppress the stranger and mistreat the weak and keep the sick sick and corrupt the courts, the Bible, biblical prophets accuse the political leaders of public infidelity. Unlike in marriage, such adultery is not a private matter and it must be challenged in the public square. The problem is too many preachers are willing to overlook the, the policy failings in exchange for access to power. And they have said things like, Jesus' teachings are about private morality and not public policy. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, but never told Caesar how to run Rome. Well, that's just not true. Jesus' first sermon said, I've come to preach good news to the poor, and the Greek word for poor there is patokos, patokos, which means the poor who have been made poor by economic exploitation and imperialism. That was his first sermon. And his last sermon, Jesus says that every nation in the final analysis and the final judgment, every nation will be judged and will be, have to give an account for how they treated the vulnerable among us in public policy. And Jesus' good friend that he often quoted from Isaiah said that woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey. It is hard to imagine someone who proclaimed the kingdom of God in the first century not to have a clear vision about transforming society. It's hard to imagine that unless your whole faith has been built upon the justification of systemic evil. Now this kind of reading of the biblical text is not new and we need to see it for what it is because it's being used to confuse the minds of so many people. This, this brand was passed down by generations of so-called Christians who learned to read the Bible in the 19th century as a text that did not condemn but rather affirmed race-based chattel slavery and public policy that legalized it. That's why Frederick Douglass once said, between the Christianity of the slaveholder and the Christianity of Christ, I see the widest possible difference. The widest possible difference. Preston historian Kevin Cruz has documented how public religiosity that wraps itself in the flag while doing the biz bidding of big business is a purchased product. He said it was purchased in his book of research by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Sun Oil, beginning in the 1930s when they funded organizations like the Spiritual Mobilization Group that paid preachers to preach a twisted form of Calvinism to take on the social gospel of people like Rauschenbusch and, Rausch and later Dr. King. And, the, and this perverted form of Calvinism went like this. If you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. So if you're a good American, you won't be poor. And if you're a bad American, you're poor. So therefore, you don't need social security. You don't need living wages. People just need to live according to certain precepts. And it was purchased. And in fact, by 1940, the leader of it had bought 19,000 pulpits. This is a, was a 21st, 20th century of slaveholder religion that the plantation owners had paid preachers to defend slavery in the 19th century and is still with us today. When Robert Jeffers and Franklin Graham, who got $10 million somewhere from somewhere to go all around the country during the election, encouraging people to vote a certain way and then had the nerve to say that the election of the current occupant of the White House was God's will. Robert Jeffries, Franklin Graham, Jerry Falwell, and all those who, who go in and pray P-R-A-Y for a president, while that president, while that president and the legislators are praying P-R-Y, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G on the least of these. We cannot understand some of what's going on without understanding this heretical form of Christian nationalism 
that tries to limit the moral discussion to being against gay people and against prayer in the, for prayer in the school and against um, um, uh, abortion and for gun rights and for tax welfare to the wealthy. This is what now some are calling Trump evangelicals. And they are not forsaking their God to defend Trump. They are showing us that their God is cash and not Christ. And for Trump's personal failings, he needs personal, professional counseling. But for his mean and vulgar use of power, he and his allies, this not just him, he and his allies, he can't write a law. He and his allies in the Congress need public critique and moral resistance. No matter how high the Dow Jones average is, it can never be high enough to be a sufficient payoff for us to keep quiet in the face of such moral inconsistency. We must see this. Now, if we're going to save our ship of state, we must, as I said, see this systemic racism. We must see how this heretical form of morality is being used to confuse the public square. And then if we see that, then we must see what kind of politics and policies you get when you mix this kind of systemic racism with classism and with a distorted moral view. What do you get? You get us having fewer voting rights today than the people had 53 years ago on August 6, 19. 55, because issues are seen as left versus right, not as right versus wrong. What do you get? You get 25 states that have passed laws that preempt cities from passing their own local minimum wage laws. What do you get? You get the criminalization of poverty that has raised federal spending on prisons tenfold to $7.5 billion a year and led to increased policing to fill them. Nearly 5 million people in, in 1968, wasn't but 180,000 in jail. Now nearly 5 million people. We got 2 million more people in prison than China, and China has a billion and a half more people than us. That's what happens with racism and classism and a false moral narrative are woven together, and people use it from which to shape public policy. What do you get? Federal spending on immigration deportation and the border has gone from $2 billion in 1976 to $17 billion in 2015, with 10 times as many deportions, 333,000 in 2015, according to our report, The Souls of Poor Folk, an audit being done by the Institute for Public Policy Studies and, and, and the um, Ur Urban Institute that Dr. Tyson and Dr. Forbes and others are working on. What do you get? As of 2016, there are 40 million people living below the poverty line. This is an income-based measure that is limited to $11,880 for a single person. In other words, if you make $11,881, you are not poor as a single person. $24,300 for a family of four, which means if you make $24,301, according to the statistics, you are not a poor person, and there are four 40 million people living below poverty. This means there's been a 60% rise in the number of poor people since 1968, not because the, the programs of the war on poverty failed, but because the programs of the war on poverty were undermined. There are 95 million people who are either poor or low income, living under twice the federal poverty line, and that number rises to 140 million people, 43.5% of the population when using the supplemental poverty measures. And when you have this mix of racism and classism and a heretical morality, you get people saying things like, well, poor people are just on a vacation and a glorified vacation. 16 million of the 40 million people are women. 13 million are children. Three quarters of the people living below the poverty line are women and children. The, the, the code words of racism have called us to racialize poverty, but the reality is, is while white people are only 8.8% of white people are poor below the poverty line, that's 17.3 million people 
which is 8 million more than black. So there are 8 million more poor white people than there are black in raw numbers. In raw numbers. In raw numbers. What kind of policies do you get? You get that from 1968 to 2017, the top 1% share of the economy has doubled. In 2017, three individuals had a combined wealth of $248 billion, the same amount of wealth as the entire bottom 50% of U.S. households. And Joseph Sticklitz, when I talked with him, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, said we can't keep ignoring the cost of inequality because 250,000 people, according to the study by the Mailman School of Public Health, die every year from low income. They don't die because it's their time to die. They don't die because the divine has called them home. They die because of low wealth. We came to be the leader of the free world, and yet the U.S. pays half of its African-American workers and 60% of Latino workers less than $15 an hour while we give bailouts to corporate crooks. In the South, where politicians still pit white workers against workers of color, 50% of all workers in the South make less than $15 an hour. There are 400 families that make an average of $97,000 an hour, and we lock people up who simply march for 15. When it comes to health care, even with the Affordable Care Act, 37 million people are still insured, and now with the rolling back, more are uninsured, more premiums are going up. And you think about that. People will run for office. When you, when you mix racism and classism and a distorted moral narrative, People will run for office, look you in your faith, and say, elect me, and I'll take your health care. No, 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 worse than that. Elect me, I'll let you pay for my health care for free and take yours. In other words, elect me, and I'll accept health care that I only get because I got elected, but I'll make sure that you don't get what I get even though you elected me. And people buy it because they believe they're talking about other folk until the reality hits in Western North Carolina and West Virginia and other areas. When it comes to the health of the planet, between 1970 and 1979, meteorologists recorded 600 disasters around the world, but between 2009, 2000 and 2009, there were 3,322. Climate scientists testifying before Congress have explained to the public that two centuries of fossil fuel extractions had not, have not only built a global economy, but have released enough carbon in the atmosphere that the planet to have a fever. Today, the Earth's fever is raging, and the symptoms of rising floods and waters and drought, and poor people suffer the most and get the sickest the most from climate change. In addition to climate change, when we talk about health, poor people can buy unleaded gas, but can't buy unleaded water. <laughs> Multinational corporations are drilling for gas, penetrating the aquifers on the Apache lands. I was recently out with the Apache Nation in Arizona. Do you know to this day that, that, na that the First Nation people can't even own their own homes, own reservations? Today. I was there at the burial land. I went to the cliff where 120 Apache warriors, rather than being captured, chose to jump off the cliff. I was there in the place and, and sang the songs and cried with them, the songs of memory. And you could feel the spirit of those who were put in this valley on this piece of land. You know, the Apaches were mountain people, but they were forced into this valley. And then one night while they were in the valley, the troops opened up the river to drown them. And now, you talk, they're digging in a place called Oak Flats. They're drilling down in the earth, so-called looking for copper. And only about 2 or 3% of what they get is worth anything, but the rest of it poisons the aquifers. And the people that started doing it, they thought that if you, pause, if you drill on the, native, on the First Nation, the Apache land, if you drill there, well, it's not the land, it's the reservation. If you drill there, then somehow the poison was going to stay on their land only to find out that aquifers mean water and water travels. 
And so now the white community right down the street is worried now because they're going to be poisoned. And many of them are upset because they voted for the people like John McCain who approved the multinational company to come in and do this. The love of money is the root of all evil. Pope Francis called, calls home our common home has been reduced, he said, to a resource at best. And when I was at the Vatican lecturing this past year um, at, at, and at the invitation of the Pope by other leaders, one of the things he sent to us in his uh, letter was he said that when we refuse to address the issues of racism and poverty, we abdicate our responsibility to be the hands and the feet of God in the earth. And then the war economy and how war is often perpetrated toward black and brown citizens of, this, of the world. Vietnam military spending was 340, 354 billion. Today is 635 billion. 53 cents out of every discretionary dollar of our taxes goes directly to military. And then we create these military weapons and they end up getting sold on our streets and you can get an assault weapon easier than you can get a fishing license. And our children end up dead. And we can't break some politicians from their vampire-like bloodthirst and up with the NRA for money. And if you look at the money, if you just took a portion of the money, we could still blow the world up 50 times. That's the sad thing about it. It's not that somehow we're going to have a weak military. When you can blow the earth up 10, 15 times, that seems to be quite a bit, quite enough. If you just took a portion of that military money, the same money could provide health care for 178 million low-income pe low people. It could create more than 11 million green jobs and union jobs. It could give 7 million poor kids head starts and 442 million households solar electricity. It's not the money that we don't have. It's the moral will and the capacity to do right with what we have. Those who claim they love the military so much now say they want to give poor people their food stamp in boxes. You know, boxes of starches and canned food. And at least when Jesus gave people food, he gave them fresh fish and bread. You know, he didn't put it in a box. They want to take us back to the ghost of days past, back to Charles Dickens day. You know, back to the poor houses, I guess. But the problem with that is we give banks that abuse the system bailouts of cash and then want to give poor folk boxes of food. It's just wrong, but, but they claim they care about the military. Well, 23,000 active duty military troops receive food stamps. 24% of children in schools run by the Department of Defense inside the U.S. qualify for free meals. And another 21% qualify for reduced price meals. We have to see this. What this race, when you deal with race and class, and a distorted morale, what kind of policy does it create? It creates a policy where four million families with children are being exposed to high levels of lead. It creates the kind of public policy that's all right with three miles of, that, that the populations within three miles of highly contaminated Superfund sites, 45% of them are non-white, 45%, even though the majority near these super fun fights are still white in raw numbers. And so if we see this, then that means we need to understand why now we need to organize intentionally. We're going to save our ship of state. We got to see right. But then we've got to organize intentionally. Long before Dr. King took, a bullet took his life, Dr. King, Rabbi Heschel, and others saw that systemic policy violence threaten the soul of this nation through interlocking issues of injustice. In 1967-68, he, he paired this diagnosis and called it the Poor People's Campaign. He said America's spiritual sickness was terminal 
and insisted that unless we experienced a radical revolution of values, such a moral revival, he knew, could not simply be spoken into existence, it had to be lived into existence. The poor people who were often blamed and pitted against one another would have to unite in a national campaign of direct action to save the souls of America, and others would have to come alongside of them. Fifty years later, Dr. King's life and witness can help us name America's spiritual sickness and see that the only hope is a brand new time of fusion politics. We face a national crisis, not unlike in some ways the storm that rocked America in 68. But too often, our attempts to diagnose what ails us cannot get beyond the tired debates of left versus right and Democrat versus Republican. That is why we need a poor people's campaign, a national call to a moral revival more than ever. Because there are five interlocking injustices Five bacteria, if you will, five diseases that threaten democracy of the United States simultaneously. Systemic racism, systemic poverty, environment, ecological devastation, the war economy, militarism, and the distorted moral view of Christian nationalism. Now, I would, as a preacher, I would love and like to hope that this crisis would compel Americans to cry out to whatever source of divinity they know for help. But far too much of our religion and our public life has contributed to the moral crisis we now face. We suffer from a civil religion that has justified our social sin. And so America has a moral malady. And sometimes it tempts us to despair. But it also then can bring us in the darkest moments to the reality that we must have a moral movement, that there's only one way out. We've got to link up with others who are directly impacted by the interlocking injustices. We cannot just deal with these separately. Black people can't get over here and deal with racism, white people over here with poverty, and environmentalists over here. No, we have to find a way to connect together in a deeply moral way with a deeply progressive and prophetic agenda and refuse to be divided by the few who seem to benefit from a system that hurts us all. America, I believe, is right in the middle and the possibility of a third reconstruction. And at this moment, this moment like this must remind us of the one truth that is at the heart of the tradition of resistance that goes all the way back to the great psalmist, found it in Psalm 118, the stones that the builders rejected can become the chief cornerstone. In other words, what we need now is the work of the rejected stones to lead a revival. Those who have been rejected through racism, rejected through classism, rejected through homophobia, rejected because of poverty, rejected because of, of militarism, rejected. That fusion coalition must come together and we must assert our moral authority as children of God, believing that we can shift the nation's narrative. We must know this, that when a budget director goes on TV and puts an ash cross on his forehead on Ash Wednesday, and then proposes to cut Medicare and cut seven million people from heating assistance and cut people's food stamps, we don't have merely a Democrat or Republican problem. We have a moral problem, and we need a poor people's campaign, a national call for a moral revival. When, when, leaders, when leaders of both parties will celebrate a budget compromise, and one side will say we did it for the military, and the other side says we did it for the middle class, and nobody says what was done for the poor the 140 some million people. We need a moral revival and a poor people's campaign. When we are 53 years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, and we have the attacks on voting rights like we haven't seen since Jim Crow, 
when people are more interested in protecting the NRA than funding our schools, when we refuse to stop the selling of assault rifles, but we cut health care and want to ban DACA students, when we destroy the environment, when, when we want to fund the war machine and fund a racist border wall, but we defend defunding pro poverty programs and refuse to pay people a living wages and protect unions' rights, when you have preachers claiming to be representing God, they're so loud when it comes to being against gay people and abortion and prayer for the schools and loud on supporting tax cuts for the wealth, with tax cut welfare for the rich and the greedy at the tunes of trillions of dollars, the amount of dollars we haven't seen transferred on the backs of poor people like since the time of slavery and when they claim Trump is the will of God and they say nothing about racism and poverty and stopping the sale of assault guns, we must have a movement that challenges this heresy and names this hypocrisy and refuses to stand down. And this must be a movement rooted in love. It can't be just a movement about hate and what we're against or hating individuals. It must be a movement rooted in love and truth. It must be a movement where we hate the policies, but we almost have a deep pity for the powerful that will use their power to hurt people. Because I tell you, the other day I was thinking as I was reading through some Howard Thurman, something is wrong in the hearts of people when they gain power and then they use that power to inflict pain on the poor and the vulnerable. How much do you have to dehumanize yourself in order to dehumanize other people? That is the question before America. <laughs> Rabbi Heschel told America in 1960, in fact, he said it to John Kennedy. He said, Mr. President, you, this nation forfeits the right to even worship God when you're on the wrong side of justice and racial equality. Howard Thurman once says that we rupture the unity between us and God when we are not concerned about the dispossessed. Just this week, Mary Mike Edelman, who was a leader in the Poor People's Campaign, said, wrote in an article, she said, when are we going to protect the children and not the guns? These are the kinds of moral questions. We need a moral, poor people's campaign, a national call for a moral revival that will demand full restoration of the Voting Rights Act and will demand automatic registration at 18. If you can be registered to vote, to go to war at 18, you ought to be automatically registered at 18. That will demand an open democracy that provides more than one day to vote all across the country, that demands a living wage, that demands universal health care for everybody, and we stop this ungodly voting on children's health care every five, ten years. It ought to be a divine right in this democracy. that demands guaranteed income for the poor and the weak among us, that demands that, demands that, we, that we not fund and continue to fund war and militarism, that demands that we take care of our eco ecological systems, that demands that we change, that demands that we, we ask ourselves, can America really be America? Can we live up? to the deep religious values we claim? Can we live up to the moral claims of being saying that there is no freedom worth having unless that freedom engages in making sure that we have the establishment of justice and the providing of the common defense and the promoting of the general welfare? There's no freedom worth having that does not have these things. And so we need people who will stand up and join this movement. Whether we believe in Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all the other great traditions, or no religion at all, we need to stand up. We don't need another tweet, another email. We need some people who are willing to stand with the poor. And not because this is the 50th anniversary of the death of Dr. King, because you don't commemorate an assassination. You don't celebrate an assassination. 
The only way you can pay homage to a prophet that, or prophets that have been assassinated is you have to reach down in the blood where they fail, pick up the baton, and carry it the next leg of the way. <laughs> 25, 40, 50 years later, we must deal with systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, a war economy, militarism, and this distorted national morality. It requires a moral re revival and a moral revolution of values. And that's why, as I close, we are now organizing a thousand people. Dr. King called them um, emergency drivers. Dr. King said that in the normal course of time, you have to stop at a stop sign or a stoplight. He said, but when there's a crisis, the ambulance can run the stoplight because something, somebody's hurt, somebody's sick, the nation's health is at risk. We need ambulance drivers now. And we're organizing a thousand of them in 32 states, 2,000 in the District of Columbia for 40 days of direct action, civil disobedience, voter mobilization, and power building among the poor. 40 days starting on Mother's Day, birth, ending on June 21st, the summer solstice, the birthing light. And on the 23rd, a massive poverty march and a rally, not just to, to, to march, but to give an action call that we leave and we go back forth and, these, and organize and build deeply because change doesn't happen from Washington, D.C. down. It happens from Montgomery, Birmingham, Greensboro, and Durham up. And I tell you, we've been traveling from Appalachia to Alabama, from California to South Carolina, from North Carolina to New Mexico, and I've met some people. I met a white girl over in Seattle, Washington, the highest, it has the highest density of poor white folk. And she's, she was homeless and poor in Seattle, Seattle, Washington. And she came to one of our mass meetings and she stood up and testified. She said, I want America to know that I am a redneck and I'm the white trash that America threw out and forgot to burn. And I'm joining the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. But not only that, we went down to Alabama and there's a mother there whose daughter died in her arms because Alabama would not expand Medicaid. And she said the only way she can live is to fight for other daughters not to die. She's in the Poor People's Campaign. We're headed out to West Virginia and Kentucky in the Appalachians. And there people are organizing all over. We were in Compton and watched black people and white people and Latinos come together in Compton and say we're organizing. Over in Central California, we're organizing. Up in Wisconsin, we're organizing. I was there in New Mexico. One night we had a mass meeting and a, Pue and a Pueblo spiritualist and a Jewish rabbi and a preacher and, 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 and a congregationalist and somebody else got to shouting on stage together. All of them. Like, just like Pentecost, like they were speaking in tongues together and signing up for the Poor People's Campaign. You can sign up tonight. Just go to repairsofthebreach.org. You can sign up tonight. And clergy are coming. United Church of Christ, Unitarian, Methodist, Presbyterian, rabbis, Muslims are coming together. Not to do it for the poor, because that's paternalistic, but with the poor. But we're coming conspicuously. And we're talking about being in 25 state capitals uh, all at the same time and in Ryan and McConnell's office all at the same time. And we're not going to the safe spots where they tell us we can protest. We're claiming back the people's houses all over this nation and in Washington, D.C. We're going to demand an, a, a, an aspirational agenda. We're going to demand and ask, demand the kind of goals that can set America free and turn us. We demand it from the Democrats and the Republicans. We demanded that it's time for all folk to step up. And if they, are, if they arrest us, they're going to have to arrest us linking arms with poor people. And they're going to have to arrest us in full ministerial attire. But they're going to have to arrest us if they don't, because we are going to arrest the attention of this nation and change the narrative. We cannot. We cannot have another presidential election or another mid-year 
with like the one we had in 2016, where we had 26 presidential debates in the primary and in the general election, and not one hour on poverty, not one hour on systemic racism, not one hour on ecological devastation, not one hour on the war economy. We talk more about tweets and innuendos than we did the things that are hurting people and hurting real lives. And the political structure can't change it alone. There must be a moral revival and a moral revolution of value. We need a political Pentecost. We need a political Pentecost where black and white and brown and Jew and Christian and Muslim and gay and straight and young and old learn how to speak with new tongues and how to act with new power and refuse to be denied. And we go in and we force CNN and, 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 and MSNBC and the New York Times to change whatever the tweeter was trying to get them to talk about that day because we come together and we call those 140 million people who never hear their name, poor call, we call them and recognize that that's a great army of hope. It's a great army of possibility when we all come together. And so I close tonight, not with my own words, but with the words that come from the great Jewish prophet Amos. 2,600 years ago, he wrote this, and it sounds as contemporary as it was probably when it was first heard. It actually gives us our order. Some people say, well, are you all getting your cues from the Poor People's Campaign? Yes, but we're also getting it from the abolition movement. We're also getting it from the de reconstruction movement. There are a lot of, there are a lot of streams. Uh, the stream of resistance is in no one place or among no one people. In every age, there's always had to be moral dissenters. There's always had to be somebody that will engage in moral analysis and moral articulation and moral activism. It's just our time. Don't you let anybody tell you this is the worst we've ever seen. That's an insult to the slaves. That's an insult to the survivors of the Holocaust. That's an insult to the women who had to fight for women's suffrage. That's an insult to those that went through Jim Crow. That's an insult to Cesar Chavez and the early Mexican people in their fight. That's an insult to say this is the worst. This is not the worst we've ever seen. It's bad, but it ain't the worst. Somebody, I told somebody the other day, if Harriet Tubman could get 500 slaves out of slavery, and she didn't have, she didn't have Twitter, she didn't have tweets, she didn't have a cell phone, she didn't have a computer, all she had was moss on the north side of the tree, a made up mind, a 38 in her pocket in case somebody wanted to go back to slavery, she would send them to heaven and let them be free up there. But anyway, This is not the worst we've seen, but we've seen it. And if we see it, we have to organize in it. And then lastly, we gotta stand together because it's our time. And so Amos said it like this in the fifth chapter. Listen to this and I'm through. Amos said, listen, people hate this kind of talk because raw truth is never popular. But here it is bluntly spoken, this is verse 12 and 13. Because as a nation, you run roughshod over the poor and because you take bread right out of their mouths, I want to tell you as a nation, you will never move into your luxurious homes that you've built. And you're never going to drink in peace the wine at Marlego. I mean the wine, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Every the wine, let me read the text like it said, the wine from the expensive vineyard you planted. I know precisely the extent of your violations as a nation. I know the enormity of your sins and it is appalling. You, the leaders of that time, you bully right living people. You take bribes right and left and you kick the poor when they're down. Some people began to think that justice is a lost cause and evil is epidemic and decent people are throwing up their hands and some of them even said that protest and rebuke are useless and a waste of breath. But verse 14, but I need somebody. I need a group of people that will seek good and not evil and live. I need a group of people that will say to the nation, you keep talking about God bless you, God loves you. Well, act like it. 
And the way a nation acts like it is verse 15, you hate evil and you love good and then you work it out in public policy and then maybe God will notice you. Verse 16 says, now I need a remnant because this nation is not going to do right on its own. So I need a remnant. Maybe I need a thousand people in 25 states and 2,000 in Washington, D.C. I need a remnant that will go out and cry loudly and refuse to shut up until change comes. I need a remnant that will fill up the malls and the shops and warn the nation that it can't be who she claims to be until she does right by the poor and the least of these. I need a nation, a, 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 a group of people that will say, not me, not us, not now. I need a group of people that will empty the offices, empty the stores, this is in the Bible, empty the factories, empty the workplaces, and enlist everybody in a general lament until you make the nation here. And God says, I want to hear you in the streets crying so loud over what's so wrong. And if you do, then I will make my visit. Could it be that God, the divine spirit, is simply waiting on us to get in the street and cry? And then if we do, that divine spirit will help us change the soul and save the heart of this democracy. I'm old enough now that I want to try and see what God will do. It's time to save our ship of state. We got to see what's wrong. We've got to organize and we must stand together and launch this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and dare to shift the narrative and declare to history yet been, that has yet been and the future that is yet to come. In our time, with the few breaths of life that we had and the few years in this earth, we chose to be silent. We chose not to be content. We chose to cry loud and to change the heart of this nation. God bless you. As a doctor, I know that Reverend Barber has been, his body has been through a lot lately. And I would, I, I would like to, to thank him for all the energy he shared with us and give him formal permission to take a rest. <clears throat> and as an historian, I want to thank him for reminding us that our story is part of a much bigger story. And the, he reminded us of the story of of the 1890s, of the fusionist movement that seemed to bring, hope to bring poor whites and blacks together, how it collapsed in the 1890s, climaxing with the Wilmington race riot. But remember in Durham, part of our story is that just two years after that, a black physician, Aaron, Dr. Aaron Moore, worked with a formerly very poor white farmer, Washington Duke, and built Lincoln Hospital. And out of, the, out of that chaos of that decade, there was hope. And he left. <clears throat> anyway, I wanted to thank him for his words, for sharing his historical perspective, for sharing his faith. 
And I would like to encourage all of you to join him in his future work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend Barber.